name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Dr. Ben Locker. Dr. Locker, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Dr. Locker received his PhD from the University of Connecticut. He taught as a professor of English at Grand Valley State University for 35 years, where he received the Alumni Association's Outstanding Educator Award. He is the author of The Sacred Marriage, Psychic Integration in the Fairy Queen, and Ethereal Rumors, T.S. Eliot's Physics and Poetics, as well as articles on Eliot and on Renaissance literature. He has served as president of the T.S. Eliot Society, and recently he edited a collection of essays T.S. Eliot and Christian Tradition. And I myself was fortunate enough to have Dr. Lockyard as a professor when I was at Grand Valley State University. So really looking forward to talking with you today, Dr. Lockyard. Uh, the subject today, this is being premiered on the Feast of the Solemnity of Mary, the Mother of God, a.k.a. the Circumcision of Our Lord. And it is a day to honor the Mother of God. And the subject today is really... Uh, women, w- the, the subject of woman in Christian literature, focusing especially on Dante. And mm-hmm. it's a very fitting topic because of the way that Christian literature really has a distinctive tone regarding woman. And so we're going to talk about that today. And before we get into the main topic, uh, Dr. Lockyer, tell us about why should Catholics read good literature, like something like Dante? That's a, that's a big question, but it's a good question. And uh, people have questioned it. I mean, it seems self-evident to you and to me that we should do that. But uh, it has been questioned beginning with even Plato, who famously in the Republic said that poets would be banned from the uh, ideal state. Uh, that might have been ironic and probably was ironic in my reading of it. But nevertheless, that kicked off the whole discussion. And he was answered by Aristotle, his student, who uh, said that in the poetics, said that uh, literature uh, was valuable in that it it, uh, represented universals and in that it represented human action and morality in human action. Uh, so it, uh, it has something to teach. Then uh, uh, I'm giving the very shortest uh, summary here, but uh, uh, Horace, the uh, Roman poet, uh, uh, famously said that uh, poetry should uh, in, entertain and instruct. And that's a crucial insight that uh, literature entertains us if it didn't, we wouldn't read it, really. Uh, and, but in entertaining us, it also instructs us. And the two are, in literature, inseparable. Uh, the, the entertainment and the instruction work together. Uh, when you get down to uh, Dante, in his, he, he didn't write a lot of literary theory, but he did write a famous letter to a patron, Con Grande de la Scala, And he said that um, uh, a good literary work should be allegorical, should represent the uh, spiritual matters. And he said it should lead us to salvation. (laughs) So that's a pretty big claim. (laughs) Or it should help us along the way to salvation. I forget the exact wording of it. Uh, And... Then in the Renaissance, Sir Philip Sidney made a big claim, kind of following Aristotle, well, definitely following Aristotle. He said that literature uh, is better than history and better than philosophy because history presents only particulars, not universals. And philosophy presents universal truths, but only... Uh, in the abstract way, whereas literature 
presents those universals in a way that is attractive to our souls and to our hearts. Uh, Sydney was responding to a Puritan preacher who said that uh, literature was always bad. Well, that was always uh, the work of the devil. And uh, <laughs> Sydney starts that uh, uh, defense of poetry out by saying, oh, does that include the Psalms? <laughs> and, uh, and the other literary works in the Old, in the old and New Testament. Uh, so he has the guy right where he wants him uh, right from the beginning. But I think that's a characteristic uh, moment where there is in one branch of uh, Protestantism anyway, a, a profound distrust of literature. And of course, literature sometimes lives up to that uh, and, and does lead people in a bad direction, especially some modern works. But uh, on the whole, it tends to enlighten us uh, the, the best works anyway, uh, do that. And they do it in such a way that our, not only is our mind moved towards virtue, but our hearts are moved towards virtue. That's Sydney's point. It, it inspires us uh, and touches our hearts. That gets picked up later on by C.S. Lewis in his uh, Men Without Chests uh, uh, chapter in The Abolition of Man, where he too says that uh, that the value of literature is that emotional uh, inspiration that goes along with an intellectual insight. So uh, that's a short form of the answer. I, one of my mentors, Russell Kirk, often spoke of the moral imagination, a phrase that he got from Edmund Burke. And made essentially the same argument that good literature uh, moves us towards moral action. Excellent. Well, speaking of moral action, um, when we talk about the distinctive Christian literature that begins to arise around the turn of the first millennium, uh, before that there was various epics and, um, but the particular, when we talk about the literature regarding woman, it's the chivalrous literature, the courtly love tradition that comes to mind. It's really, mm -hmm. I, I believe, the first, really the first distinctive Christian literature that arises, which appears to me to essentially the, the distinctive features regarding woman are that there is a great awe and respect and honor towards woman in the, the beauty of a woman and that this beauty can only be possessed through sacrifice, acts of sacrifice. Is that a good summation of the courtly loved, the chivalrous literature regarding its distinctiveness towards woman? Yes, it is. I think it's excellent. <laughs> um, I like to point out that I think this came about uh, largely through the instruction of the church that it, uh, right around 1000 AD, the uh, church was, uh, you know, in. Uh, let's push it back to the fall of the Roman Empire in the 400s. And that left a vacuum. There was a, the literacy rate plummeted. There was no literature, essentially. Uh, and you had monks copying texts which kept the classics and uh, and the Christian writers, the, the Christian theological writers uh, in, in print as it were. But there was very little, uh, very, very little original writing going on. Or if there was, it was something like Beowulf which wasn't written down until later anyway. It was, uh, came out of an oral tradition. So, the church was living through these so-called dark ages, a term that I don't really like because there were good things going on, but it, there's some truth to it. And part of the problem was that the vacuum created by the fall of Rome was filled by these Germanic tribes who were pretty bloodthirsty. <laughs> they, they were war, warrior people and they uh, really spent their lives fighting each other uh, for dominance. So they were uh, brutal, 
in their activities. And, the tr and yet they converted to Christianity, uh, most of them. And so the church was trying to rein that in a little bit. And the uh, papacy, back around a thousand, published two documents, the peace of God and the truce of God. And these two documents made rules for warfare. They said, uh, first of all, don't, don't conduct war on high holy days. And they really included all Sundays and all the high holy days, or even they, they expanded it quite a bit actually, so that you were left with, uh, uh, you couldn't even, uh, the whole season of Lent was off limits. You know, you couldn't, uh, couldn't conduct warfare at that time. They very uh, severely restricted the times of war. And then the, the other document, uh, the Peace of God, restricted the kinds of people you could attack. And it said, you know, don't attack priests, don't attack nuns, and don't attack women, which was kind of a new concept to these, uh, to these barbarian uh, Germans. Uh, who must have been scratching their heads saying, well, come on, those are easy pickings. We, we, that's what we do. Uh, but little by little, they submitted to that, to that discipline. And that's really, I think, I think it's pretty clearly the origin of what we call chivalry. A chivalric knight is a warrior, but he doesn't attack any unarmed people and especially not women. Uh, so, uh, and religious. That really transformed very slowly over a period of a couple hundred years that transformed the European uh, civilization or turned it towards civilization, you might say. Anyway, so one thing that came out of that was the chivalric code of warfare. But on the other side, you what came out of it was the courtly love tradition in literature. This arose about a century later, right around 1100, in the south of France, and it was a court uh, a, a type of literature produced in courts by courtiers and for courtiers. It was uh, refined, um, and as you say, the main idea of it was that love for a woman would inspire a man to be virtuous and brave and good. So that was a new thing. <laughs> that, was really, yeah. uh, that seemed to come almost out of nowhere. But again, I think it came out of the church, the, the church saying, you have to respect women. Uh, they're human beings. So there's certainly a great contrast with the Germanic barbarians. Now, how does the view of woman that comes in into the 1100s with the courtly love tradition, how does that contrast with the classical authors and how they view women? Well, you know, things are complicated. I was thinking about this in, in preparation for our talk and thought, well, I don't want to oversimplify the story and make, make the, the Christian Middle Ages the the only time when women were presented as fully human. Uh, but there's some truth to that. I mean, yeah, certainly you can go back to the Old Testament and there are the great matriarchs there. Uh, and they clearly have a, an outsized influence on the, on the Israelites and so on. But uh, the Greeks and the Romans, in their take Homer, the, uh, uh, the, the starting place for everything. And you have women as war prizes. Um, Achilles' anger comes from his having been robbed of the, the beautiful woman, the Trojan woman that he wanted for his war prize by Agamemnon. So obviously that's an objectification of women. And uh, even though at the same time, there are women goddesses. So obviously there's a certain respect for the feminine just in the fact that there are not only gods, but goddesses. Yet the goddesses don't behave in a particularly uplifting 
manner any more than the gods do. So there, it, I don't think that really ends up increasing respect for the feminine that you have Athena uh, or who comes up to uh, uh, a warrior in the middle of the battle and just smacks him in the chest and, and completely uh, destroys, she doesn't kill him, but she robs him of his ability. Or uh, Aphrodite who enters into the fray and then gets wounded and goes crying to her father. It's not, not too uplifting in either case. So I think it's true that the that the Roman, the Greeks and the Romans in their literature and in their culture uh, did not uh, express great respect for women as equal human persons. Though on the other hand, you can say the Spartan women took care of business at home while their men were off fighting all the time. And so there, there are complications to it, but uh, yeah. or, uh, take the, um, you know, you're probably well aware that in ancient Rome, it was such a paternalistic culture that the father of the family could decide at a child's birth whether to kill it or let it live. And nobody else had a, a word to say about it. That's one of the things the church confronted. <laughs> you know, uh, killing babies is not allowed. Uh, so the church has been in that business right from the beginning of, of trying to bring in greater respect for human life and greater respect for women. And what is the role of the cult of the Virgin Mary in all of this? It, it, historically, it happens that the cult of the Virgin Mary flourished at the same time as this courtly love uh, tradition was flourishing in literature. And that's not accidental. The two are, are deeply intertwined with each other. So respect for women in courtly love is an adjunct to the increasing veneration of the Blessed Virgin. And one great Gothic cathedral after another is named Notre Dame, you know, that it's just uh, it, everywhere. Um, the rosary arises at that time or the widespread use of it arises in those centuries, the 1100s, 1200s, and um, where did that come from? <laughs> it came from some profound spiritual movement within the church to, uh, to recognize the absolute necessity of Mary in the, in the plan of salvation, uh, which is pretty clear in the Bible to begin with, but uh, it had to be and I should say, it, it, you know, the church always recognized that. That was one of the early issues, you know, among the theologians was Mary the mother of God or just the mother of the earthly part of Jesus or whatever. And so you have a, a place like uh, Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, St. Mary Major, which was, I think, the fifth century. And uh, you have these, this wonderful... Um, mosaic of Mary, uh, this huge figure of Mary on a throne, and she's uh, Theotokos. She's the mother of God, the, the God bearer. So the church was fighting for that uh, from an early time. And it really uh, comes to fruition, I think, in the Middle Ages. Absolutely. No. One question I did have, though, is do the Greeks develop any sort of chivalrous literature of any kind? They've got the cult of the Virgin Mary. They've got Greek and the classics. Does anything rise in the East that's analogous to what happens in the West here? You know, I'm, I'm less at home there, but I don't think so. Uh, you know, in, in um, India... You have the, the Buddhist tradition, and in the Near East, you have the Islamic tradition, both great, you know, world religions. 
But in neither one of them were women given uh, the respect, I think, that they are in Christianity. It's not an accident that the whole movement towards women's rights came out of Europe and America, not, not out of uh, Asia or, uh, or the Muslim countries. Uh, we're talking about some very big topics. And of course, some Muslim writers would, would say, no, that's not true. You know, there's great respect for women. Uh, and, and there's some truth to that, <laughs> but, uh, but not a lot. Right. Yeah, I understand. Now, um, before we get into Dante, um, one of the things that can be puzzling, I think, about the Corley Love tradition is that it is often adulterous in its object. It's, it's a poem of one married man to a married woman, and they're not married to each other. How do we understand this in context? How does that contrast with the type of thing we get today with a similar situation? How do we understand this, this type of uh, content? Yeah, that's been debated uh, over and over again. And I don't think we have definite conclusions on it. But there are a couple of things to point out. One is that marriage was uh, arranged, marriages were arranged, and uh, arra they were uh, especially arranged for aristocratic people. You, didn't, you couldn't marry the person you chose if you were a prince or a lord. Uh, and sometimes feminists make a big deal out of this, but the men, the men were forced into marriage as much as the women were. It was, <laughs> it was arranged for both of them. So, uh, and it was arranged for dynastic purposes. We want to keep the wealth and the lands of this family or these two families consolidated and not let that dribble away into other uh, poor families. So it was for financial reasons, really, and reasons of political power as well. But it wasn't a very ennobling ideal, uh, idea of marriage, and it didn't, uh, didn't particularly involve the idea of love. So when this love poetry began to be written in earnest, the, it was hard for people to imagine that you would find love within marriage, as strange as that sounds to our ears. So I think that's one explanation, that it was just a reaction to the, um, the, the fact that, especially in aristocratic families, marriage was not about love. Then, uh, there's also the question of whether this adulterous poetry was serious or not. And I'm inclined to think that some of it was just a court game, writing these beautiful poems, uh, uh, honoring some beautiful woman in, in the court. But I think it's a little bit unlikely that these courtiers were really trying to seduce the women they were writing the poems for. Uh, if so, you certainly wouldn't want to publish them, which they did. Uh, at least, I mean, they didn't have printing presses, but they, but they let them be read by other people, apparently, which would have been extremely dangerous if the woman was married to another man and, and quite likely another man more powerful than you are. It just doesn't make sense that you would do that. So uh, I think it was kind of a courtly game, a sort of pastime, uh, but, and, and I'm not alone. A lot, of, a lot of scholars take that view, but we don't have definite evidence on it. So it's partly in response to the lack of, uh, to, to marriage as a, as a financial and dynastic commitment, and partly it is uh, a courtly pastime. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I've heard one historian remark that uh, really among the most Christians, there was 
what we might call real marriage because of the, you know, most people were peasants and that type of thing. We're not, they weren't having an arranged dynastic marriage, you know, so there's a lot more of that going on, but let's get into Dante. Okay. Um, so the first work that we can discuss is La Vita Nuova. That is a, a collection of poems by Dante. And he also comments on his own poems and, this is where I think I'm not sure if this is where Beatrice is first introduced, but tell us about this work of Dante and it's, it's role in t- showing us a picture of the Christian view of woman. Yes. Uh, the title means the new life. And he is, uh, he is saying that he entered into a new life through his love of Beatrice. Uh, he, fell in love with this young woman uh, and it was love at a distance. This was uh, a lot of the courtly love poetry does present the uh, love from a distance, not, not an attempt at seduction. And that's certainly the case with the Vita Nova. He falls in love with her. He sees her goodness and her spiritual purity and chastity, and he uh, finds himself moved towards uh, being a better person by that experience. So it changes his life radically and dramatically uh, for the better. It's, that's the uh, thesis of the Vita Nuova. And then, of course, that gets that's just a prelude to the uh, divine comedy. Oh, something that I really noticed in reading this was these epithets that would seem to be um, very Marian. Um, he's, he mentions full of grace very often. Um, what do you see as the role, if any, of Mary in this praise and sort of this conversion that happens in this, in this interaction with beauty in this woman? Absolutely essential. Uh, Dante was steeped in the Marian devotion and he was especially uh, moved by the writings of St. Bernard of Clairvaux who appears at the end of the Paradiso and is kind of his final guide. Uh, and, and uh, St. Bernard promoted Marian veneration uh, more than practically anybody else. And so I think Dante is clearly, uh, clearly following in those footsteps. And look, you don't use a phrase uh, like, uh, like that without uh, calling, evoking Mary. He clearly intended to do so. So how does how does Beatrice convert Dante if we're, we're still in sort of a, you know, he's married, not married to Beatrice. He's married mm-hmm. to someone else. Mm-hmm. How exactly does she convert him? And what does that say about the Christian view of woman? Yeah. She, it seems as if she doesn't have to do very much, you know, she just kind of walks past him as it were. And he sees, it's a vision to him. It's a vision of beauty, but also a vision of truth and goodness and and spiritual purity. And he finds himself longing for that and doing what he needs to do to enter into that and leave his former life behind. So uh, it's it's a process of conversion where she's not actively talking to him and saying, look, you have to do this and so on and so forth. Uh, We don't have any, he doesn't really record any conversations that they had. It's just, uh, it's just an inspiration. Yeah. And what is the role of, like you said, there's not a lot of conversation. It's very, it seems to be so much a, an experience of beauty Mm -hmm. and, how, how do we contrast this experience of beauty of woman and an appreciation of beauty, which has a converting effect with 
the way that in, in sort of our modern, I wouldn't even call it literature, the, the modern popular culture that passes for literature, you know, music mm -hmm. and whatnot. The thing that that's popular today, there is a notion of beauty, of attractiveness, of eros in that quote unquote literature. Um, but what makes that interaction with beauty so different than this one? Yeah. Well, that's tricky, isn't it? Because we are moved by feminine beauty and, um, and it's hard to tell sometimes whether that, whether we're moved lustfully or uh, spiritually because the two can easily be intertwined. And I think sometimes I was thinking this afternoon about a, a much later work, uh, uh, French novel called Bubu de Montparnasse uh, from the early 20th century, where a young man falls in love with a prostitute, you know, that old story. And even though she's an objectified woman, he uh, isn't, he, he loves her. <laughs> he finds something beyond just the lustful attraction in his relationship with her. So it can go either direction, I think. I, it, it can move in one way or the other, in a good way or bad. And, um, but I think Dante is also influenced by the Neoplatonic tradition in philosophy, which regarded earthly beauty as a reflection of spiritual beauty. And, uh, if you think of the works, the paintings of Botticelli, for example, you have these, uh, even in his Venus, if you know that painting, the, the birth of Venus, uh, she is, it, this is Venus. I mean, she's the goddess of erotic love. And in Homer, she's nothing but that. It's, there's, it's, it's pure lust. But the way Botticelli, portrays her, even though she's naked and riding out of the sea on a, on a scallop shell. Uh, she has long hair that, she, that covers her breasts and she covers her genitals. She's, she's uh, chaste. <laughs> she's, and there's something that subtly evokes uh, this sounds sacrilegious, but it subtly evokes the Virgin Mary. And I I'm pretty sure that Botticelli intended that. Uh, and that's that, that uh, Florentine Neoplatonism, that, um, that, that's a little later movement. That's the, that's the Renaissance uh, time. But it was already there for Dante as well. And it does see physical beauty as... Uh, as tied into, or that's not the right word, as a uh, reflection, I think is what I want to say, a reflection of spiritual beauty. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. It's certainly, it's, yeah, it is. Um, the, the, the reflection of spiritual beauty is so clearly seen in the Virgin Mary, but I think you're bringing out a very a great point in the way that Dante in the new life, he sees physical beauty where we don't see a physical beauty in the Virgin Mary. It's sort of a, an experience of pure spiritual beauty, beauty of spiritual purity. Mm -hmm. And somehow the, the physical beauty of Beatrice is an experience of spiritual purity, something about the exquisiteness of her physical beauty. I think I find that to be very much very Christian in the sense of an experience of beauty. But I want to get to uh, the Divine if Comedy. I, if I can just oh, go ahead, go ahead. Throw this in too. This is again something that that the Catholic Church has always maintained that the physical world, though fallen, is not uh, is not completely lost. You know, there's still uh, that's why we have. Uh, physical, uh, physical signs in our sacraments that, because the physical world has meaning in it. And that's one thing that was lost to a large extent by the Reformation. 
Yeah, like you mentioned, the Puritans, uh, you know, we just celebrated Christmas. This is what they tried to stamp out. (laughs) So there's certainly a strong Puritanism. And it it comes into Catholicism, too, with Jansenism. You know, they were against the Sacred Heart and things like that. And but I think what uh, you're getting at here so beautifully is just the the spiritual nature of physical beauty itself which is still Mm -hmm. also can be a reflection of the divine. Um, So the divine comedy is the divine comedy. I mean, is it the greatest piece of Christian literature ever? Uh, It's it's certainly, is it? uh, That was, that was unhesitating. Okay. Why, why is it the greatest? (laughs) I I suppose I'm influenced partly by my man, T.S. Eliot, who said one time, uh, uh, Dante and Shakespeare divide the world between them. There is no third. (laughs) And that's maybe overstated, but, uh, you know, I had a a colleague at Grand Valley who was a secularized, atheistic, um, Jewish person, uh, and very brilliant. And he and I taught a Dante class together one time. Uh, and because he loved Dante, you know, he just said, this is great. All right, let's teach it together. You can do the Catholic stuff and I'll do the, I'll just talk about it as literature. And it, it was really a, a joy because it's, uh, as literature, so transcendently powerful and meaningful. Uh, but of course, as, uh, as, as Catholic uh, literature, it's even more meaningful. Absolutely. Now, the the copy that you told us to buy for our class was this one. Mm -hmm. This is the Bantam Classics uh, translation by Alan uh, Mandelbaum. Is this the best English translation, you think? Oh, you know, this is the there's there's a new translation. There's a new translation every every other year. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And uh, and you won't find too many people agreeing on what is the best translation. Uh, so, uh, actually it was this colleague of mine I just mentioned who said, well, let's use this translation. He liked the translation and he liked the notes. Uh, so I said, let's go with it. And I, I liked it. I found I liked it a lot too, and just stuck with it over the years. Um, but you have, uh, hold on a sec. Now. More recently, you have a translation by the outstanding Catholic scholar, Anthony Esselin. Um, and that's, um, I've, I've used that a little bit and I find that quite wonderful also. So, Excellent. Whatever translation you use, you want to have the Italian uh, uh, facing page so, so that you can dip into the Italian a little bit, uh, even if you don't really know Italian as I do not. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do really like the notes in the um, the Bantam edition because there's so many different allusions that he makes to current events that are mm-hmm. lost or classical events or things like that that are easily missed. And so it's it's really great. So uh, before we get more into the content, um, once again, just for people who may be new to Dante, what would you say is a good way to read Dante, like out loud, you mentioned reading the Italian. Mm -hmm. um, And also for people who may be new to Dante it is each canto, it's basically a chapter, essentially. Um, They're quite short. So Mm -hmm. it's not, uh, it it is an epic poem, but it is very doable in the sense of the chapters, so to speak, are, are quite short. So what would you say to a beginner? What would be the best way to approach the divine comedy? Well, I would say first get some kind of overview, um, and there's some of that in the Mandelbaum uh, translation, uh, but get, um, I had a book, I don't know if it's, I can tell you where it is now, if I still have it or not, but by a Jesuit uh, writer that just gave an overview of the uh, Divine Comedy, and I found that very helpful when I was first really trying to get into it. Um, so. I, I think there's no shame in reading a crib, let's say, uh, a good but 
short and simple explanation of the basic trajectory of the three canticles. And um, then in, uh, in these great works, I think it's very important if you're first reading it, not to get bogged down. Don't look at all the footnotes. Don't, don't look at any of them if you can help yourself. Just read it and you'll understand it. And as you read more of it, you'll understand it more. Um, when I'm teaching Shakespeare, where people have the problem with the, uh, with the early modern English, I get my students to read quite a few plays and I say, just stick with me. You'll get better at reading it by reading it more than you will by having it explained. So, and after a few uh, plays, they, most of them admit that that's happening. They, you just, your ear starts to hear it. So that's, I, I think, don't, don't try to understand it all. You, there are people who are, you know, Italian scholars and have spent their whole life studying it and they're still finding things they're not quite sure about. So um, don't get bogged down. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the first uh, passage of the Divine Comedy I wanted to mention in, in relation to our subject was um, Canto number five in the Inferno. Which is, which is about the lustful. And it mentions these two lovers who are reading a courtly love poem mm -hmm. and how the courtly love poem itself became an occasion of sin for them and they sinned and went to hell for it. So what is Dante getting at here since he's been in sort of an author like this, in, at least in a sense, uh, what is Dante getting at with this? Well, it is self-critical, and you know we you typically we make a distinction between Dante the poet and Dante the pilgrim. Sometimes people will call him the one who's going through the character who's going through the uh, experience, even though he says you know, he speaks of himself in the first person. Actually, he doesn't use the word "I" until much later, and he doesn't use his name until much later, but. Uh, anyway, uh, Dante the poet is chastising himself, in, I think, in that passage, and he continues to do it throughout the poem. Uh, sometimes Virgil chastises him, <laughs> but this is a more subtle chastisement where uh, he hears Paolo and Francesca telling their story. I think it's Francesca who tells it. And then she says, well, we were reading this story of Lancelot and Guinevere, and, uh, and that day we read no more. <laughs> I, I, I'm laughing because sometimes I had students who said, well, they stopped reading. And I said, well, why did they stop reading? <laughs> I don't know, maybe they just got bored or something. No, come on, pay attention here. <laughs> Uh, they stopped reading because they were caught in lust. And um, and by the way, she was married to Paolo's brother. So that complicates things too. And her brother killed them uh, when he found out about it and they went straight to hell. So there, uh, and Dante the Pilgrim expresses uh, sympathy for them. And in fact, he faints as after the story is told, he, he faints. And you say, well, well, is that a good thing that he was sympathetic to these people? But I think it becomes clear in the context of the whole poem that no, it wasn't a good thing. It was his own, his, his own lustfulness that made him faint. Uh, and he needs to, that's a sin that he has to come to grips with. Yeah. So how is this ultimate, this thread of, of this sort of subtext in the uh, Inferno, as you said, he's chastising himself as time goes on. Now, does it come up also in the Purgatorio at all? Yes, it does. Uh, in the, it's sort of flipped in the in Inferno that lust is the first of the sins and the least horrible. Dante says that the sins of, of desire for uh, sex and for food and for money are, 
are more understandable in a sense. They'll still get you to hell. You know, he says, don't, don't misunderstand. But they're not as bad as the sins of, uh, especially the uh, sins of treachery, where you deliberately undermine somebody you should love and um, destroy that person. So Dante is a little bit sympathetic to those. Then in the Purgatorio, it's flipped the other way around and the more serious sins are dealt with at the lower levels and those people have to climb the purgatorial mountain slowly, slowly. At the top are the sins of lust. And there he meets a poet friend of his uh, who's named Arnaud Daniel. Uh, he's a Provencal poet and uh, Arnaud he, uh, steps out of the flames for a minute to talk to his old friend Dante, and um, there's a and Dante pays him the tribute of uh, writing a passage in Provençal, actually, uh, and um, uh, uh, it's a, and it's a it's an expression of love. But at the end of that passage, uh, Dante says, and then he hid himself in the fires that refine them. So Arnaud has been purified of lust and is quick to return to his purgatorial fires, uh, knowing that that's the only way to get to heaven. So I think Dante learns a little bit more there. And then he meets Beatrice at the end of the purgatorio and uh, she greets him rather harshly. She says something like, what are you doing here? Did you not know that men here are happy? Not like you, in other words, you know, you're uh, not happy. You're not uh, happy because you're not virtuous. And uh, so it's a very harsh greeting that he gets from her. And the reader kind of says, come on, Beatrice, this guy has gone through a lot. He's gone all the way through hell and up the mountain of purgatory. And this is how you, <laughs> and, and he's done it for you, uh, but she, she kind of smacks him down. And she continues in the Paradiso to instruct him in a pretty preachy way uh, to say, no, you still don't understand. You still don't understand. Then toward near the end of the Paradiso, uh, he see, Beatrice goes back into the heavenly rose where all the saints are, reside and goes back to her proper place. And Dante's gaze is drawn away from her to the center of the rose where Mary is, the, the, the center of all the saints. And Beatrice smiles at him. So uh, she's smiling because he finally gets it. The, her beauty uh, is meant to draw him to Mary's. And then Mary, in turn, gazes at her son, and his gaze is carried that direction. So that's a great moment where he finally gets it. You know, this, uh, uh, you know, we were talking about this Neoplatonic idea that the earthly beauty of Beatrice has brought him slowly, slowly to the moment where he can respond to the eternal beauty. So would you say that it is Dante is the divine comedy sort of the uh, summation in this, in this frame of mind that we're talking about the, the respect and honor for woman, physical beauty, spiritual beauty is Dante sort of the culmination of this development? Yes, I think so. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I wrote this, book on, on Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, which was a few centuries later. And I think there's another culmination in the Renaissance. I think that uh, Spencer, though he was um, Church of England and really um, treated the Catholic Church very harshly in that poem, is was a traditionalist and, and um, he, uh, it's, it's a huge poem and we 
can't get into that right now, but he also presents the um, kind of the apotheosis of, of courtly love in a more spiritual love there. Um, this is all laid out in a book by C.S. Lewis called The Allegory of Love. And he traces this courtly love tradition uh, up to Spencer and says this, in Spencer you have marital love held up as a locus of love, you know, not just of, not just a dynasty. And, um, he, but it's the, the adulterous idea of love has been left completely behind. In fact, it's interesting uh, that Spencer wrote a sonnet sequence in which, uh, by the way, some of the earliest sonnets were Dante's sonnets in the uh, Vigia Nova, uh, but uh, Spencer's sonnets are written to a young woman he's courting. And the sonnets are, the culmination of the sonnets is a marriage poem that he offers to his wife on their wedding day. So uh, unlike the other, all the other sonnets, uh, Philip Sidney's or Shakespeare's or whatever, uh, who, where, the, where the goal is still adulterous, uh, Spencer says, no, <laughs> real love is love that expresses itself in matrimony. Excellent. So um, wrapping up here, so if, if Spencer sort of is another culmination, what is the result of that you see in literature with the, the treatment of women uh, since the Protestant revolt and, and on uh, mm -hmm. into the future? That's a, you know, I've been thinking about that since you and I uh, talked about holding this conversation and I'm a little hesitant to say, I, I, I kind of want to blame the Protestants for a lot of things. And I think they deserve blame for a lot of things. But uh, I mean, look at Henry VIII, you know, uh, here's an exemplum of how badly things can go wrong when you cut yourself off from the truth. Uh, and, and the guy is, is killing his wives so he can move on. And, um, but on the other hand, as I say, you've got a poet like Spencer writing a little bit after Henry's time and uh, holding up a very high ideal. Uh, you have even John Milton, who is uh, he's a heretic. Uh, he doesn't even believe in the Trinity, but I think his vision of male and female is really a pretty good one, except for a few moments like where he says, he forgot only she forgot in him, which is kind of absurd. But um, when you get into the modern period, all things, you know, things just go towards chaos, I'm afraid. And, I, and certainly there's, the, beauty is no longer spiritually uplifting a lot of modern works. Uh, on the other hand, I think any work that is written pretty seriously and is not aiming to be pornographic or something will inevitably tap into the truth of the human person. Otherwise, it won't be good. <laughs> so I don't know. I've noticed this even in cheap movies. Uh, I can't think of an example right now, but where you think, well, this is just entertainment of a very low level, but almost inevitably there will be a turn towards something true or else it's just not enjoyable. So, um, I, I've been, uh, when, when you and I started talking, I pulled off my shelf this, all, this um, letter by John Paul II uh, on the dignity and vocation of women. You can see it's, it's completely falling apart. Uh, not because I've read it that often. I think it was old when I got it, but uh, I reread it and I thought, gosh, this is, this is so inspiring. Uh, and he says the, that the 
even though the old, it's not that the Old Testament didn't give value to women, but Christ, he says, something new is presented by Christ and, and by St. Paul. Uh, in fact, he spends some time dealing with that uh, famous passage of Ephesians 5, uh, wives obey your husbands. But he actually quotes the beginning of the passage, which so few people do, where he says, you know, uh, be subject unto each other uh, for the sake of Christ. So that mutual subjection that happens in a, that should happen in a good marriage um, is the ideal that John Paul holds up for us, I think. And that's, uh, that would heal a lot of, a lot of problems if, if we could live that out. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Lockhart. I, I have one last question. This was not, I didn't send this to you, but I, I see a, a, a great connection between a loss of reverence and I guess the, what, what I was trying to get at, like what we're trying to get at with the, with beauty, uh, physical beauty of woman, there's definitely, there is an, there is an Eros element, a desire and I think that the element in the Christian literature is reverence, reverence for that beauty. Mm. Um, and I see a great connection with the, the decline of reverence for the beauty of woman in society and also a uglification of art of any kind, whether that's mm -hmm. architecture or visual art, because mm -hmm. it, it seems to stem from a lack of reverence for nature itself which is ultimately a rever lack of reverence from, for God. Mm -hmm. um, any comments you see, do you see that connection as well? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was thinking of today about uh, Picasso, who was a, a very great artist, but his presentation of women or men too, for that matter, but, but his presentations of women are strikingly brutal. Yes. And uh, he's a fallen away Catholic, you know, and he uh, he's lost reverence for women in a very dramatic way, uh, which is too bad. So that's one icon that came to my mind. But of course, the buildings are just unbelievable. Uh, the, the ugliness of them is uh, is shocking. And the deliberate um, uglification. I remember going to a, a funeral in a in one of these big uh, mega churches, and I was I, I don't frequent those places, and I was really shocked that there was just nothing. I mean, it was just void, except for some plants, like you would find in your dentist's office or something. You know, <laughs> it just there was no attempt at beauty whatsoever. And this is, this is the problem with the, one of the problems with the Reformation is the emphasis on the word. And of course that never could have, they wouldn't have even thought of that until the printing press was invented. Then they had the Bible and they could say, why didn't you let us read the Bible? Well, you couldn't read. And we didn't have any printed Bibles. <laughs> so, uh, but then it's all the word, the word, the word. There's no such thing as, as tradition. And there's no such thing as liturgy, and there's no such thing as, as beautiful art supporting and uh, awakening our hearts uh, so and our spirits. Big loss. Yes, excellent. Well, Dr. Lockhart, thanks so much for talking today. Do you have any further, final comments? Dante, great literature, the place of, or the veneration of women. Any final thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, one thing I love about the Divine Comedy is that he's, he says, love moves everything in the universe. This goes back to an Aristotelian idea that God, uh, that, that, that everything in the universe is drawn towards the divine in attraction. But uh, that I think Aristotle uses some sort of neutral word, but uh, Aquinas and Dante call it love, uh, that 
the universe is created by God and it tries to move towards God. And that's the source of all movement in the universe. But some of that movement gets distorted and distracted, uh, especially among uh, angels and humans who have free will. Uh, nevertheless, that the love that moves Dante towards Beatrice eventually carries him all the way up. And uh, the last, as you know, the last line in each of the three canticles talks about love. And the final line of the poem speaks of the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Absolutely beautiful. Well, Dr. Lago, th thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking about this most important topic. Um, you can pick up Dante in the uh, uh, Mandelbaum translation that we discussed, Bantam Classics. It's a little paperback. It's like $10 or less. Definitely worth the read, especially if you're locked down and you have nowhere to go and nothing else to do. Read some great literature. So uh, let's offer up a an Our Father at the end of this, uh, especially that uh, for men to honor and love woman as she deserves through the intercession of the Virgin Mary. Name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.